Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Focus on Liberia. My name is Boris Chow, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. Tonight, our topic is History of Liberia, Survey of the President. Our guest is Dr. George Clay Kia from the University of West Georgia. Dr. Kia, welcome to our show. Thank you. That was the voice of uh, Boris. That's our special guest tonight who is announcing our show for today. So Boris, thank you so much. We want to say thank you for the announcement and God bless you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Focus on Liberia. This is a continuation of our history series. As uh, Boris has announced, tonight is a survey of the Liberian presidents. Enjoy the music, invite our friends, and let's keep this going. Again, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Our uh, guest tonight is Dr. George Clay Kia. Dr. Kia, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, we, we've had a series on uh, Liberian history. We started from the 13th century, the time before 1822, all the way to present day Liberia. To climax this series, we decided to uh, do a survey of all our presidents, it's like a case study. And who's the better person to do it than a uh, political scientist and former presidential candidate, Dr. George Clay Kier. All of you watching, uh, we say welcome to all our viewers across the globe. Uh, it's been a wonderful time going through this series and we are happy that uh, we are almost concluding. Today is the climax. And uh, Dr. Kier is our guest tonight. Dr. Kier, uh, really been a good thing. I, I know. I don't know if you watched some of our history series from uh, before 1822 to present. You know, just talk, if you watch anything like that, just talk to me the significance of uh, really going through Liberian history for this month of February, extending into March. Well, uh, I saw some of the transcript. I didn't watch any of them live. I uh, certainly saw some of the transcripts, some of your guests, including Dr. Herbert Brewer and uh, 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 his, his name escapes me now, but both Dr. of them are Dr. Morgan State. Dr. Gobo. Uh, uh, Dr. Sam Gobo, yeah. Dr. Sam Gobo and Dr. Herbert Brewer. Uh, uh, I, I saw some of the essays from their interview. Uh, I, was appointed with two of them to work on a panel that was supposed to rewrite Liberia's history. So I was quite delighted 
that you had both of them on to uh, discuss some aspect of that project. Unfortunately, that project really never got off the ground and that was really unfortunate because those of us who were asked to participate in it were quite excited. But I did, I did uh, see excess of it. It's very, very important. And I'm happy that the discussion started before 1827, I mean, 1822, because most of the history books on Liberia uh, sort of ignore, uh, tends to ignore uh, the pre-1822 period is as if the history of that era formerly called the Green Coast started around that time. So it was quite important to have that. And, and I want to thank you and your colleagues because you, you're really not just providing a, a, a valuable community service, but a good learning experience, not just uh, for Liberians and Africans, but people throughout the world. I mean, to have a better understanding uh, of the Liberian experience and the various groups uh, that sort of make up that experience. And then particularly so, uh, you know, it coincides somehow with Black History Month uh, also made the uh, series uh, quite important. So uh, this, is, this is an excellent opportunity to, uh, again, as I said, uh, gain insight into uh, uh, the history of our country uh, so that we can appreciate the contributions uh, that various groups uh, have made uh, to the to the historical evolution of Liberia. Thank thank you. And uh, just briefly on Dr. Kia, Dr. George Clay Kia received his BA in political science from the University of Liberia, MA and PhD in political science from Northwestern University, Illinois, in USA. He has held several teaching and administrative positions, including lecturer of political science, University of Liberia, chair of the Department of Political Science and professor of political science and international studies at Morehouse College, Atlanta, Georgia, dean of international affairs and professor of political science and African and African American studies at Grand Valley State University, that's in Michigan, USA, and Dean of the College of Arts and Science at the University of West Georgia. Currently, he's the interim chair of the Department of Criminology and Professor of Political Science at the University of West Georgia and Professor of International Relations at the African Methodist Episcopal University in Monrovia, Liberia. He has published quite extensively on Liberia, including the books on the first Liberian Civil War, the crisis of underdevelopment, and Liberia State Filial, Collapse and Reconstitution. Currently, he's completing a book on post-conflict elections in Liberia. In addition, Dr. Kier has been quite active in Liberian affairs. Because of his pro-democracy activities, he was a political prisoner in 1979 and 1984. Dr. Kier, let's start with that a political prisoner in 1979 and 1984. Tell me briefly about that. Well, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dennis. Uh, I started my political activities at a very early age, actually in junior high school uh, in Firestone, where a group of colleagues and myself organized the what was then called the Haber U Movement, which was an advocacy group uh, for Firestone workers. So my political consciousness was actually built by my uh, living and being raised on a Firestone plantation where, I mean, anybody who knows about Liberian affairs uh, would certainly agree, clearly reflected the two Liberias that we had. The Liberia of the economically powerful and politically well-connected and the Liberia of the economically marginalized and, and, and politically marginalized as well. So it was at Firestone that our consciousness had developed and it set up a continuum uh, to shape my, my own life as I went to high school and then eventually to the University of Liberia uh, where it all crystallized. And uh, briefly, uh, the first time I got arrested and became a political prisoner was after the April 14 uprising uh, during the Tobo administration, there were about 33 of us uh, from Moja and Pal and Afafanga and the University of Liberia Student Union. 
uh, who the Liberian government accused of being the ringleaders uh, of that mass demonstration and, you know, were praising for a couple of months and subsequently released. And then the second time, of course, was in 1984 during the Doe administration, uh, when uh, Dr. Sawyer myself, along with some of the top brides in the then People's Redemption Council were accused of plotting the war through the Doe government and were arrested and, and put in prison again, spent a couple of months and then and then got released. So, uh, you know, that, that, that has been, or those two events actually were some of the chronic moments of, or have been some of the chronic moments of my own involvement in Liberian politics, particularly uh, in the fight to uh, not just create a democratic society for all of our people, uh, but a society in which we can take uh, advantage of all of the vast natural and human resources that God has blessed us with so that we can be the Liberia and wish our li the lives of our people can be better. Thank, thank, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it was important that you mentioned that because I read your profile and like political science, bachelor degree, political science, uh, master's degree and political science, PhD. Too much politics you learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, career-wise, I always, uh, wanted to be a teacher of government and I developed that interest uh, more profoundly at the University of Liberia where I had the privilege to really have some of the best, the best minds anybody could have as teacher, Dr. Sawyer, Dr. Formula, the late Dr. Abraham Jeans. I mean, so those were folks that really, 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 you know, developed my interest in political science. So I always wanted to be, uh, uh, you know, like them, a, 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 a university professor and I read there, God, thank you that he has given me the opportunity to certainly achieve that dream. Right, and uh, these are just uh, uh, this is our water cooler moment because uh, we are so glad to have you because uh, no better person has I said to talk about a grand president than you. Okay, as I was saying previously, we went through you know Liberian history before 1822 up to present, and uh, even interviewing these historians and. Uh, uh, Scholars, really, I have learned so much. And uh, when I went through this, I decided to uh, put what I learned into prose. So I, I, I wrote a poem that I want to share based on what I've learned so far on Liberian history from Dr. Brewer, Dr. Govo, Dr. Tayo, and now you. So here is how I, I put it. Liberia means freedom. They came from the North, East, and West. Many of them came on foot through the jungles. Others came in boats, canoes, and ships through the waters, all seeking refuge from war, dominance, bondage, and threats. They wanted to be free, left alone to enjoy life and thrive. The Gola, Vai, and Kua with all their cousins. The Mandingo, Ma, Dan, Bandi, and more. The former slaves and those rescued from slave ships all converged on a land that would symbolize freedom. For this purpose, a pan-African nation was built, a country born out of the need for deliverance from all evil. And that is how Liberia came to be and must be the glorious land of liberty by God's command. This is actually excellent, uh, 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 Dennis. I must commend you for this, for this level of creativity and ingenuity. You really captured the accents of the Liberian society, particularly the different strength, strengths that make up the society. And my, 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 my prayer, because you know this has been a lifelong commitment as well, is that we can take advantage of that diversity. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad often uh, when we try to you know, pass ourselves along the old divide of the repatriated Africans who came versus the groups uh, that they met. And your point captures the essence of, of that. I mean, we are there now. I mean, you, you yeah. said, as you said, Corey, some came on foot, some came on ship on kingdoms from collapsing empires in the, in West, West and East Africa. Others came from the Caribbean. We, when we all met there. So the, the, the question is not how our four bears got to Liberia, it's how mm -hmm. those of us who are their descendants can work together and build a democratic and prosperous Liberia for all of our people, irrespective of what their ancestral backgrounds might be. That, that has been the enduring challenge 
And that's the challenge that we really, really got to be fully committed to uh, to working on. Because, uh, you know, as you know, it, it is, and your audience knows, it's, it's really irrelevant in terms of, you know, what what people ethnic or other kinds of background are. It's, 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 it's the content of people's character, as Dr. Martin Luther King used to say, that really, really, really matter. What is an individual committed to in terms of improving the lives of our people? What are he came from settler background, he grew a bachelor, so that should be totally irrelevant. That, that, thank you, thank you. And we wonder, because you know, it's, it's good to really look at Liberia and know that we, 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 Liberia was, you know, found there as a place of refuge, not only by the former slaves, but also by Africans coming from those collapsed empires and for various reasons. So, it, you know, it's fine. But that's all, that's, that's then, today, our topic is on the presidents of Liberia. There is no political conversation involving Liberia that does not talk about the presidents. One time I wrote that uh, the president fill our lives. So there is no way we cannot get away. But what we have not done is uh, we have not really critically looked at our presidents. When I was in uh, Kiron Garden, we memorized the rhyme, Joseph Jenkins, Rabel, Stephen A. Benson. But we, <laughs> really know who they were, whether these people were actual human beings. I don't know if other people <laughs> did. As regards their policies, who they were, what impact the, the administration had on Liberia and Liberians, we don't know. So tonight we are glad to have you to walk us through from Joseph Jenkins Rabbles to George Manning Bakumbe Weir. Once again, welcome to Focus on Liberia and let's get this going. Thank you, Dennis. Well, let's, let's try to do that. Let's try to do that quickly. Let's Let's start with Rabbers. Uh, Rabbers, of course, as you and your audience will know, uh, had the daunting task of providing leadership in really building a new nation. So he was the he was our first president. So he and his government had the Herculean task of actually building a state. I mean, which was quite challenging. And 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 to Rabbers credit, uh, he had excellent leadership skills, excellent diplomatic skills. Uh, and so he was well suited for the position. But Robert became president against the background of two major challenges that were facing Liberia. One was, of course, as we had uh, the discussion in the previous section, the state or the country that was created uh, in 1847, deliberately by its constitutional design, and unfortunately, I may add, left out the majority of the Liberians, the people who were members of the various African groups that our brothers and sisters who came from the United States met on the Green Coast that subsequently became Liberia. So when the country was established, they were denied citizenship for 100 years, for an entire century. From It was not until 1947 on Tottenham that President Tottenham, that citizenship was extended to, uh, you know, people of indigenous background. And President Roberts and his, his successors realized that that was a major problem. So that was one major challenge. The second major challenge, of course, that Roberts also had to deal with was the constant encroachment of Liberia's territory, particularly by the British and the French, uh, who, of course, given their own uh, imperial agenda, had designs on expanding the uh, colonial empire since they were next door in uh, Sierra Leone and, and uh, in Sierra Leone for the British and Guinea and Cote d'Ivoire for, for, for the French. So, so President Roberts did a, you know, a fairly good job in, in, in you know, moving the country through those difficult periods. And then of course he got succeeded by uh, Stevie A. Benson, uh, uh, who was his vice president, interestingly, uh, Benson was Roberts' vice president, and then when Roberts sought a third, uh, a fourth term of office, Benson, his own vice president, ran against him and defeated him. And became, that's, so that's how Benson became the second president of Liberia. He ran against uh, uh, his, the man with whom he had served as, uh, uh, as vice president. And so, of course, Benson was faced with the, with the same challenges. Uh, and to add to that, of course, the growing economic problems uh, because the the sort of a thriving economy uh, which had characterized the Liberian situation prior to even the Declaration of Independence 
uh, that economy, uh, you know, began to experience some major problems now because uh, Liberian businesses in the agricultural, particularly in the commercial and shipping areas, were now facing major competition from well-resourced European firms. Uh, and unfortunately, those like indigenous uh, and local Liberian businesses did not have the appropriate response. Uh, and so there was uh, a serious economic problem, uh, problems that, that, uh, that Benson experienced. Uh, and then of course, that was made worse by the fact that what was the Liberian state initially was a very small territory confined mainly to the enclaves along, uh, along the St. Paul River. So the vast interior, as we know it today, were completely outside the jurisdiction of the Liberian state, run basically by, by, by various indigenous groups that had set up their own state systems in those areas. So uh, after Benson, we had, uh, we had Dana B. Warner, and, and Warner, knowing and sensing that challenge, decided to commission Benjamin J.K. Anderson who did an exploratory mission and expedition to the interior to get a sense of what those indigenous uh, uh, ethnic entities look like and to get a sense of what the resource lay of the land was. Uh, and so Bensi made his report and that led the Liberian government to the process of beginning to trying to expand the scope of the Liberian state basically beyond uh, the 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 St. Paul River enclaves into the interior, which of course brought brought the government into more conflict with uh, the various uh, ethnically based uh, uh, state mini states that were set up in the interior. And so, uh, Wanda then got succeeded by uh, James Springs Payne, uh, who uh, of course continued to face the three major challenges that I named. French and British imperialism, and then of and then of course, uh, you know, resistance by various indigenous ethnic groups, uh, because as I said at the beginning, they were not included uh, in the state, and you know, Pin, uh, like his uh, predecessors, had said they realized that 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 indeed, you know, that was a that was a mistake. So then, uh, you know, Pin got uh, Pin got succeeded by Roy. Uh, and it's important to mention that from, from Rabbers to Roy, uh, Liberian politics and the Liberian presidency in particular were dominated mainly by uh, a section of the repatriated Africans who belonged to what was called a so-called mulatto stock. These were the light-skinned uh, uh, repatriated Africans, so rabbis and the rest of them were of that of that of that ancestry. They were relatively well educated, relatively well off, so they really dominated Liberian politics up to that point. Now, Roy, sensing that, led the organization of the, what became the True Party, uh, and the True Party then challenged what was the dominant political party then called the Republican Party. Uh, and the True Party was able to mobilize support and defeat. And the True Party basically uh, portrayed itself as the champion of the uh, repatriated Africans in the United States of the, the dark, darker skin color. Uh, and that group quite clearly uh, was in a majority. So that had the True Party come to power on a Roy. But Roy's tenure was short lived. Uh, because he faced a number of major problems, including the uh, the ones we the, the ones that I tried to previously lay out. Uh, key among those problems, of course, was the Republican Party was unhappy with his loss loss of political power, so he was doing everything possible in his power uh, to get a Roy. Uh, and so Roy was accused of embezzling a loan. He was accused of trying to change the presidential term of office. Because up to uh, the, the way the constitution was designed, the president term of office used to be two years. Okay. So the president had a very short term, it was two years. Because the mindset at that time was that the presidency and political office in general were not supposed to be careers. People really did not let to work for the government, but all of that changed as we discussed before, when the economic situation became very difficult beginning around 1869 
that's when the government really became a major source of employment for folks. But for about the first uh, 22 years after independence, uh, people were mainly working in the private sector. I mean, you know, government was just seen as an opportunity. You go in, you, you render service, and you leave. So the two-year term of the president clearly reflected that, that the intent was not to really have uh, lifelong career government officials. So rather, uh, uh, Pien, and uh, I'm sorry, Roy, and all other things were accused of wanting to change the term of office. And the, the, the confluence of those factors, of course, led to his removal on uh, questionable circumstances. Of course, he died in the process. Uh, and they're, they're conflicting historical accounts of what really happened. Uh, one account, of course, claims that uh, he was deliberately murdered. Uh, others claim that he wanted to escape and he drowned. So, you know, they're, they're, as, as I said, a number of conflicting historical accounts. But he got replaced by James Smith, who was his vice president. So Smith completed Roy's term and then uh, Smith got replaced again by, then Roberts came back on the political scene, ran for president again, uh, got elected as, as, uh, as president. This is what we now read around, you know, 1872 thereabout, uh, and said until oh, about uh, 1876, got replaced by Stevie A. Benson, who was making his own second uh, term. So Rob, during the Roberts presidency, the second time around, of course, uh, he had to deal with the the very serious economic problems that the country was not facing because at this point, what Liberia was basically doing was borrowing loans from the British, other Europeans, uh, and these loans were given at a, a very high price, not just in terms of the interest rate, but some of the conditions. I mean, the country was basically put on a receivership. So it was like, uh, it was a country owned in name only uh, in terms of uh, the fact that he had a, a flag and all of that stuff, but economically it was really being controlled from the outside. So Roberts had to deal with that challenge. Uh, uh, Jane Springpin, who replaced him, then also uh, had to deal uh, with that challenge. Uh, then Pin, of course, got replaced by Alfred Russell. Uh, Russell said a, a very short term of office because he resigned. Uh, then he got replaced by his vice by 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 his vice president Anthony W. Gardner. Uh, Gardner, of course, like his predecessor, the immediate predecessor, had to deal with the major concern of the government at that time, which was basically the economic viability of the country. Uh, he served. Uh, and then, of course, got replaced by Hillary, uh, uh, Hillary uh, Johnson. Now, up to this point, up to Hillary Johnson, the Republican Party, we represented the light-skinned repatriated Africans and the so-called mulatto, had re regained political control of the country after Roy's removal. So they were dominating the uh, politics of the country, and the Hillary Johnson broke that, broke that, broke that uh, domination. And from, from Hillary Johnson's term, uh, or around 1883 up to Talbot, uh, the true party then dominated Liberian politics for, for the, I mean, just the rest of that period. So the, the true party's stranglehold on the politics of Liberia uh, was for a very, very, very long time. So uh, Johnson got replaced by, by Cheeseman, of course, in addition to the major economic challenges faced in the country. Johnson, of course, faced challenges from the, the British. He had to, under pressure, give the Galinas, uh, that's a territory around Sierra Leone, they had to give it back, give it basically to the British, and, they, and that part was incorporated into, uh, into Sierra Leone. So on top of all the domestic economic problems, uh, he had to deal with uh, the constant problems from, uh, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, the, from the British. So then Chiefsman okay. again, of course, uh, Cheeseman died in office. Dr. Kia, before you continue. Sure. All through this time, those were elections being held that bringing these people to power. Right. But in this election, the still or uh, indigenous Liberians were not citizens, so they were not part of that election. Correct. They didn't, they didn't vote. The indigenous Liberians did not have the right to vote until 1947. 
Okay. Let, let, let's move on with Cheeseman. Yeah, so Cheeseman died in office uh, and then got replaced by Vice President Coleman. Uh, Coleman faced some major problems because one of the uh, one of the things he was already accused of was that he, he was incompetent, that his government was actually incompetent, uh, that it had not come up with the requisite policies to deal with the country's challenges, including, of course, the continual resistance from the African ethnic groups that were based in the interior, uh, the economic situation the country was facing, the continual territorial encroachment from the British and the French. So he was forced to resign. So mm -hmm. he resigned. Uh, and the way the Constitution was written at that time, uh, his, the, the speaker was next in line, but the speaker was called Hale. But then the argument was made that Hale was not Hale who made things worse. So the legislature quickly uh, changed the Constitution and made the Secretary of State the next in line. And that's how Garrison Gibson became the president after Coleman. So, uh, so uh, Gibson, Gibson uh, replaced uh, Coleman as president, of course, facing the same, uh, the same challenges. And then, of course, uh, he was then followed by, by Daniel E. Howard. And Honor, Honor Howard's presidency, one of the key challenges, of course, was the resistance particularly by uh, the, the choir ethnic groups along the southeastern flank of the country had already increased. Uh, and, and so Howard and his government already saw that as posing threat to the very viability of the Liberian state itself. So the Liberian government already devised very repressive means uh, in trying to quell that rebellion. In fact, the government was assisted in that process by the U.S. government. The U.S. government diverted a naval vessel uh, to Liberia to help the Liberian government to uh, beat back that resistance, uh, particularly uh, on, in the southeastern region during Howard's uh, uh, presidency. So Howard was quite was quite notorious for his very repressive uh, tactics, and he actually laid a foundation for what became the imperial presidency, this strong presidency that we now have, how already laid the background for that. And then after Barclay already finished the, the, the plan. Uh, in 1904, Barclay came up with what was called the Barclay Plan. And, and under that plan, uh, the, the entire interior was reorganized because by this time, the Liberian government now has succeeded in extending the country's authority to the interior. So once that was done, President Arthur Barclay then felt that, uh, that he was going to set up uh, an, an interior administrative system. And mm -hmm. under that system, that's how we came up with district commissioners and all of that. So the system of district commissioners were, de were developed during Barclay's, Arthur Barclay's administration under the Barclay plan. And, and this, this uh, chain of command was developed where the district commissioners then will report uh, through the what uh, it was called then the Secretary of the Interior who will now be the Minister of Internal Affairs report through the Secretary of the Interior to the President. So the idea was to make the President the ultimate decision maker, uh, you know, of this what was to then develop into this vast interior administrative uh, machinery run by DCs through the through the the, the Ministry of the of Internal Affairs uh, and then to the President. A second key element of that Barclay plan was the creator of the creation of the military. That's how the Liberian Frontier Force got created in 1907. And the Frontier Force was basically created for two major reasons. One, to suppress rebellion by still restive uh, indigenous ethnic groups, particularly in the, in the Southeastern region, because the groups in the Southeastern region remain very resistant to the authority of the Liberian state for a very long time. So the LFF, as it was initially called, was created to be able to deal with, uh, with, with those rebellious ethnic groups in a very brutal way. The second major purpose of the Frontier Force, of course, was, uh, was tax administration, because that's how, the, that's how the hot tax was developed. And the LFF was used to go into the interior 
and basically subject folks to very inhumane conditions as a way of forcing them to, to pay hot tax. Uh, and so it is the LFF that subsequently became the armed forces of, uh, uh, the armed forces of Liberia. So Arthur Barclay lay, as I said before, the foundation for what we are experiencing today of this overly powerful, overly expansive president or presidency uh, in Liberia. So he left and then he was replaced by Charles D.B. King. King, uh, of I course. Dr. Kier? Yeah? I just want to stop you because you have mentioned twice about uh, rebellion in the Southeast. So I, I want us to talk a little bit sure. on, on that. Absolutely. Yeah, but before that, I want to welcome all our guests across the globe. This is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing the Liberian presidents. That is a survey of the Liberian presidents from President Joseph Jenkins Rabbit to our current president, President George Mane Weah. Our guest is Dr. George Clay Kier, a political scientist and professor currently at our University of West Georgia and also the AMEU in Monrovia. Dr. Kia, again, or uh, the rebellion in the Southeast, tell me a little bit about why was it and what was it all about and what was the, uh, the end result? The rebellion in the Southeast was basically uh, uh, twofold. Uh, one was that the groups in the Southeast were arguing and saying, well, look, you said we're not citizens of this country, but you are forcing us to pay taxes uh, you're taking our land, you're taking our cattle, and, but you said we're not, we're not citizens. So we would prefer basically joining the British if we have to. So if we, if we, if we, if we, if we want a country to attach ourselves to, we don't attach ourselves to the British or the French because, you know, the Liberian government has really not provided us uh, citizenship. And so we are, we're basically, you know, operating in a system in which we are taxed. Our properties are taken, but you know we got no legal recourse because we're not citizens of the country. So those issues were actually the, at the heart of the rebellion, and the way the the way the rebellion was addressed was through brute, brute, very brute force. You know, beginning Howard used force, King used force, and Edwin Barclay, Edwin J. Barclay, crowned it out. In fact, it was Edwin J. Barclay who actually brought the full force of the LFF. In fact, they went to the East Coast, I mean, to the Southeast, burned down uh, villages, homes, towns, uh, particularly in that Sastan region. Uh, uh, so, so Edwin J. Barclay, you know, sort of crowned out uh, the process that of, of suppressing, uh, you know, indigenous communities in the interior, particularly in the, in the uh, Southeastern region that Dana E. Howard basically has started. And as I said, with CDB King, uh, his administration, of course, was notorious for the financial crisis, uh, which was uh, a situation in which the Liberian government was complacent in recruiting slave labor, recruiting Liberians as slave labor, and sending and and sending them to work uh, on a plantation in uh, a, 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 a Spanish enclave called Fenarepo. Uh That issue was raised by Thomas J. Ira Faulkner. Faulkner ran for president uh, against King. And of course, King rigged the election. In fact, that election, the, 19, the 1927 election was the most not only the most fraudulent election in the history of Liberia, but one of the most fraudulent elections in the world because it's in the Guinness Book of World Records. The, 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 number, the, number, the number of votes that were, that were alleged that King won were more than a number of registered voters. <laughs> so, so it was, it was, it was, as I said, not only the most fraudulent election we've had, but one of the most fraudulent in the world. So Faulkner was the one who actually brought this government policy of slave labor to the attention of the international community. And the League of Nations then set up a commission called the Christie Commission. And that commission went to Liberia, investigated, and of course found that yes, indeed, the Liberian government was complacent. Uh, in his policy of slave labor. And in the end, President King, his vice president, Ali Yancey, and his postmaster, General Samuel Ross, all three of them resigned. And that's how Barclay became uh, the president, because he was the secretary of state. 
uh, keep in mind the order of succession had not been changed, where the second in command now was no longer the speaker, or the second to the presidency was no longer the speaker, it was not a secretary of state. So Barclay became uh, a president by replacing King after King resigned. And as I said before in my earlier comments, uh, Barclay, among other things, uh, was quite notorious for his suppressive tactics against the folks in the southeastern region. Uh, he, he, on balance, tried to address the country's economic problems as well. Uh, and one of the things that he tried to do uh, was to open up the economies to foreign investors. So what became the open door policy on Tottenham later on, uh, that the framework for that policy was ready laid by Barclay. Uh, and then he also tried to renegotiate the, the Firestone Concession Agreement uh, that, that was signed during the King administration in 1926, an agreement that was very lopsided uh, and that heavily fewer Firestone. So Barclay himself uh, uh, knew that as Secretary of State, so he tried to renegotiate that that that, that agreement as well. So, uh, on balance, uh, I would say that Barclay's greatest contribution was trying to address the country's economic problems. Uh, his worst, essentially, was rather than finding ways to integrate the indigenous population uh, into the body politic, uh, he taught the use of force. Uh, will be the way basically to subdue them. So why he made laudable strides or his administration made laudable, laudable strides uh, in terms of trying to address the country's perennial economic problems, uh, I, I believe based on the evidence that uh, he performed quite very poorly in terms of trying to integrate the country. Then of course, uh, when his term was over, uh, he then basically recruited William V.S. Tottenham uh, Tottenham, President, uh, who became President Tottenham later, was first a senator from Maryland, and then he became an associate justice of the Supreme Court. And so President Barclay, as the outgoing leader of the True Party, re recruited Tottenham to be the party presidential candidate, but there was stiff opposition against Tottenham, particularly from the Monrovia wing of the True Party, led by folks like Clarence L. Simpson. Uh, Samson felt that he should have been the president. So the compromise then was that Tottenham was made a presidential candidate and Simpson was made his, uh, his running mate. And so that, you know, Tottenham became president in, in the 1944 uh, election, but Tottenham clearly had his, his own plans. Uh, and of course, as we know, you know, given the fact that he, he was the longest serving president we had for 27 years, he certainly had enough time to uh, put those plans in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in action. Let's sort of quickly go through that. Uh, one of the things that he did, and uh, in a very clever way, was that he knew that he did not really have a political base among the Liberians of uh, repatriate background. So he made a determination that, well, look, if I can grant citizenship to, to the indigenous group there yeah, in the majority, uh, they certainly will be indebted to me and they can become my, my political base. So that's, that was the decision he made. So in 1947, uh, Liberians of indigenous background got citizenship. And of course, as Tutman correctly predicted, uh, he became endeared to them. You know, he created four new counties, Bong Lofa, Nima, and Grand Jire, uh, yeah, uh, people from indigenous background, uh, you know, serving the legislature for the first time. And not that, not that they are serving there made any profound difference for the material conditions of Liberians, but, you know, folks saw those as, you know, uh, important uh, forms of symbolism. And I in the folks uh, to Tottenham. And of course, Tottenham then moved very quickly uh, to essentially abolish the liberal democratic system because Keep in mind that even though uh, the majority of Liberians of indigenous background were not granted citizenship, within the narrow confines of, of, of politics, within, dominated in a, in a community of, of, of Liberians of African uh, uh, repatriated background from the US, uh, there was liberal democracy, competitive party system, rule of, you know, rule of law, freedom of the press, and all of those things were, were essentially being practiced. What President Tottenham did in 1955 was basically 
also abolish uh, that liberal democratic system. Uh, and the, the whole incident with D12 uh, was the beginning of that process. So 12 was forced into exile. Uh, his party was banned. Uh, and uh, a number of leaders who were associated with 12, as Roman Horace and folks like those, they were arrested, stripped literally naked, paraded through the streets of Monrovia. Uh, mm. And that's how uh, the True Way Party then became the, the de facto single political party in Liberia from 1955 until about 1980, very briefly, when PAL became the Progressive People's Party and then got banned also by the legislature. And then the True Way Party was a single de facto party, not by law, but by in practice, until, uh, until the, the April 1980 coup. So we had a, the open door policy on a, on a third one uh, that was economic boom in the country, but that did not lead to development. It didn't improve the material conditions of the Liberian people. So it was a mixed opportunity. Liberia had one of the highest economic growth rates in the world at that time, next to Japan. But that, that as I said, did not translate into improving people's material condition. Todman died, replaced by, by President Tobo, his vice president for 19 years. President Tobo knew that some changes had to be made. So to his credit, he basically tried to open up the political space to liberalize politics. That's how Moja and Pal and Afa Fanga and the University of Liberia Student Union, Cottington, all these high school student governments, that's how they became very active. That's the space in which I myself got involved in Liberian politics as well. But that space closed very quickly because President Tobo was under pressure from the old guys of the True Party who basically wanted to run things. They were Tobo ran them and they were not interested uh, in opening up the space for any, uh, any kind of democracy. So President Tobo's credit in addition to trying to open up the space too, was that he was well invested in development projects. I mean, uh, you know, a number of, of projects, uh, you know, including efforts to, for Liberia to feed itself. Uh, then of course, as we all know, the coup happened. Uh, the military came to power first. Uh, they they the country for about, about six years, and then, you know, though in the fraudulent 1985 election, he became elected as president. Uh, and, the, you know, although the country was nominally a multi party democracy, but, you know, uh, though unleashed the repressive machinery of the state against its political opponents, both rear and, and imagine, but at, at least to his credit, uh, he did undertake some development projects as, as well. Uh, and then we had a war, as you know, uh, uh, and then we had elections and Mr. Taylor came to power and we, we saw basically political repression at its height, no kind of social and economic development for the six years Mr. Taylor was in power. I mean, it was basically a continuation of things that were happening during the war. Then we had a second war, uh, the, 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 the lower layer war from 1999 to 2003, and then we had, of course, an interim government on Bryan, then the election in 2005 that brought Mrs. Salif to power. She was president for two terms. And under Mrs. Salif, Liberia received the most money in terms of development assistance. Uh, the last time I checked the data, Liberia got uh, somewhere in the neighborhood where between eight or nine billion dollars in development assistance. I just couldn't believe it because for that kind of money in development assistance, we still don't have electricity and running water our public schools are in shambles. I mean, you know, the country is still very, I mean, disappointingly in a desperate state. So in the case of President Salif, I will give her credit for, uh, since the Dodmore era, for, for basically running the most open society. I mean, Liberians have greater freedom in expressing their views, whether in the present or otherwise, on the whole, and I will call that her greatest accomplishment. But I would say her, 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 uh, the worst was on the economic and social side. With all that development aid, uh, she certainly could have provided the requisite leadership in improving the material conditions of our people. And of course, you know, 12 years was a long time to do that. And then, of course, uh, we now have uh, President We Have. His government comes in uh, with a pro pro agenda, uh, but we still yet have to see the manifestation of how the pro poor agenda translates into first rate education for our children, jobs, food security, 
good health care, water, electricity, and whatnot. So uh, he's been in power for a year and a, about a year and a half. So in fairness to him, uh, my hope is that uh, the proper agenda will, will find expression in concrete development projects uh, that will improve the lives of our, of our people. But with the, uh, with the issues now of the lingering problem of corruption and all of that stuff, it, it gives one uh, pause because clearly the money that is needed to improve the lives of our people, I mean, that's the money that, you know, government officials here and there, uh, you know, sort of a squandering and, you know, converting into their private use. So if, 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 the, if the, we are government's pro poor agenda is, is, is to be implemented, one of the serious issues that clearly we have to be tackled, we have to be this perennial problem of corruption. It didn't start on Mr. Weir, but it is a, it is a, a problem that is still bedeviling his administration and, both, and those who are involved based on the due process of law need to be brought to justice because we have a culture of impunity in Liberia where people believe that once you are in government, you can do whatever you, you, you want. I mean, I'm, I'm saying even criminally and get away with it because no one is really gonna hold you responsible. So so in brief, uh, that that is the quick sweep of uh, the, I, I forgot to add that that, that, that between Mr. Taylor and, 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 and Brian, of course, as we know, Vice President Mose Blah, the late Mose Blah, Said for a very short time as as president, and that's how we had the number twenty five. Right. Oh, that was a clean sweep of librarian president. So on Facebook and wherever you are, I want you to prepare your comments because we want to. That was a a, a survey. We want to go you know a little more deeper so that at the end of this show, even we want to have a quick and dirty way of ranking all the presidents that Dr. Kia has spoken about. But uh, one thing we noticed is uh, you said, at, starting from Barclay, we had this imperial presidency. I think then people started yeah. saying for presidents too. So one of this is uh, this song by Mrs. Ellen. Mama Ellen gave them pressure. So there's a history of the citizens too applauding the president, singing for the president. So we, we, we're using this time so you can prepare your comments or questions as Dr. Kia also think about how we can rank our presidents from the best to the worst. Welcome back to Focus on Liberia. Again, our discussion is about the presidents of Liberia from President Joseph Jenkins Robert to our current president, President George Manuia, 25 in all. And in between there, we have some uh, interim presidents. So I, I just want you to uh, just touch briefly on the interim president, even though they are not part of the uh, group that we're dealing with, just so that our audience know that there was a crisis period and we have people in the interim taking, taking care of Liberia. How did that yeah. out of period? OK. Uh, during the first Liberian Civil War that lasted from about 89 to 97, we had a number of interim presidents. We had Dr. Sawyer first. So we had uh, we had uh, we had Dr. Sawyer. We had uh, David Pomoko. We had Wilson Sangalo, and then we had Ruth Sando Perez. So we had about four interim presidents during the first Civil War, and then of course Judy Bryan, uh, who was the fifth during the Second Civil War. So we have about five interim presidents. All right, and then there is this question of our President Moses Bly. There was a question whether he was interim or actual president. Well, he was president because because President Taylor resigned uh, uh, prior to the constitutional uh, because President Taylor was supposed to election was supposed to be held 
in October of 2003, and President Taylor was then supposed to turn over power or retain power uh, in January of 2004. So he didn't get to that point. Uh, he resigned. And so uh, Vice President Black became president. I mean, just like, uh, just like, we're, you know, just that we can't, you know, Garrison, Gibson, or, right. or, or, or Russell, or, 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 or Russell uh, you know, uh, you know uh, who, who folks who became president for a very short time after presidents resigned. Okay. We have some comments on our Facebook. Want to just read them? Mianta Dakina said, Thank you, Dr. George Click here, for all this great information. Nini Allison, great overview. And uh, uh, Chele Jutteju said, Is talking about people going to Liberia. Is it go on the people land and say they are not citizen? Interesting. So you find that interesting that uh, you'll be in Liberia and tell the people that they are not uh, citizens. Yeah. Lofa, Lofa Julia says he's going to be sending you a friend request after this show because he's just liking it. I said, good luck with that if you find Dr. Kier active on Facebook. <laughs> I will try. I, I, uh, I promise you that I will try. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, historian Sam Gobo said, Chakrat basically became a victim of a liberal policies that have been advocated all along by the progressive. He was actually going with the wind of change, but the old guys of the TWP were not in favor of quick change. Is that right? He That's right, yeah. All right. That's right. Okay. So let's let's go into our ranking. I, I know we don't have that, but we want to, to, to start that. And uh, in fairness to you, one person cannot rank, but we just want to have a quick and dirty way as we think about our presidents from someone who know a thing about two of, about these presidents. Well, I, I, I think we got to, the ranking, we got to think about exactly what is it that we want to rank them on. Now, what comes to mind, uh, three major areas for me, and, that, and this is by no way an exhaustive list. I mean, you know, the you know, the, 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 the list of indicators can be as extensive as possible. But three major areas come to me. Uh, their performance in the political area, which also has, you know, a lot of things, respect for human rights, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of association, multi-party system, all of that, the rule of law. Their performance in the economic area in terms of uh, the standard of living, uh, jobs, creation, all of that in the social area, healthcare, education, and then we add to that food security, sanitation. So those are the those are the those are the kinds of indicators that will come to mind for me. But the challenge we face is that the 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 data problem, because yeah. as you know, rankings got to be data driven. I mean, we can't just off the top of our heads, you know, on the basis of how we feel. Said, oh, this person did well here. Yeah, they point they not. They point they do well. I mean, we've got to be able to have some some hard data. And data data are only available from Tottenham to now. So there's really not much data before before Tottenham. That that will be a major one of the major challenges I will see. I will see for the I will see for the rankings. Yeah, that, that that's a challenge. And tell me why we we uh, like presidents. You know, we we anytime you talk about Liberian presidents, the ones that come to mind will be Roberts, you know, E.J. Roy, the two Barclays, and then from Tottenham all the way. Sometimes Hillary Aaron W. Johnson. So when it comes to Alfred Rosa, Gardner, Cheeseman, Coleman, and all these people, is it that they, they didn't do well? Is that why? Or why is it that not much is mentioned on them? What what well of all of them, Gardner had a long distinguished service. I mean, in fact, Gardner started his public service in Liberia as Justice of the Peace. So he had a, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you raise an interesting question as to why, you know, uh, you know, someone who had a long distinguished record, but, you know, again, is uh, folks basically picking the, the people they want to emphasize and, of course, in the, in the absence of data, because we really have not really had any, uh, you know, book or article that basically have done a survey of these presidents and really evaluated them to bring them to the public's attention. Is the is the is the ones 
you know, for example, Arthur Barclay is, is, is usually emphasized because he laid a foundation for the imperial presidency. So, uh, you know, and he, of course, they, and the establishment of the Frontier Four, Charles D. B. King became the finale poll. So, you know, so there, may, there were major events during some of those presidencies that really brought them to, you know, to public attention. And for Russell and Gardner and some of these people, I mean, they were really not much. Great. And, and now sometime or in our political discussion, we talk about, oh, this guy was the worst president, you know, starting, but we don't have, we don't have data on. But that's it, that's it. Right. But I mean, we can try to rank, I think the presidents we can try to rank will rather be from Tottenham. Okay. Because, because we have, we can, we, I mean, you know, depending on what our, what our evaluative criteria might be, we can find data for those. And on the basis of the data, we can rank them. I mean, that's, that's a good project to undertake. Right. I mean, so instead of rather, you know, giving that assessment on the basis of how we feel, you know, we yeah. can come up with, with with some criteria and say, all right, okay, based on these criteria, let's, you know, perhaps rank the presidents since World War II, from Tottenham to now. Yeah. One thing we, we, we I also learned from, uh, especially Dr. Brewer, is not to read history backwards. Because right now, sometimes when you look at our current realities, you're trying to look back and we always look back and look at, quote, unquote, good old days. Yeah. So based on those, we sometimes give high marks to, administration before. Yeah. Our political discussion today kind of lean towards President Herbert as being yeah. one of the best president. What do you think? Yeah. How do how do you assess uh Tutman or uh, Tutbert when when we look at well, well, um, I mean based based on the based on the based on the data uh uh based on I, I mean I will give you credit for opening up the political space, although, as we discussed, it closed very quickly because he fell to the pressure of the old guys. Uh, but he, he, to his credit, really opened up the space after Tottenham had really closed it for, the, for almost the 27 years that he was president. Uh, so that really gave rise to this push and clamor for democracy for which the old guys blame him. In fact, if 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 Tobo already had not already been overthrown, the old guys themselves were planning to remove him. Right. Yeah, they were planning. Their, they were plan, They had their own plan hatch up to uh, remove Tobo because they saw him as you know posing a threat to their uh, hold on power. The era, the 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 era in one of the eras, I, I, I believe, in which he des deserves uh, all sorts of hard marks as well, uh, is in terms of the development projects. Uh, and 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 that flowed from the fact that President Tobo was a visionary. I mean, I had the privilege to hold conversations with him twice as a young man. Uh, he had a vision. I mean, he could sit down with you and articulate whether you agree with him or disagree with him. He could he could articulate where he wanted to take Liberia, and we saw some evidence of that with a number of the little projects that wanted to farm to market row and. And and uh, you know his intervention in education. It was President Tobo that 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 brought a government subsidy to the University of Liberia. Uh, tuition at the University of Liberia, President Tobo, was thirty-seven dollars and fifty cents a semester. So he made some major interventions in some in some key areas, uh, uh, as well as uh, you know undertook major development projects. And then you know, if I may quickly add as well. We take the area of agriculture, the Bond County Agriculture Development Project, Lofa County. So, I mean, he saw self-sufficiency in food production as a as a as a major area that needed improvement. But again, th those two pressures, pressure from the family side and pressure from the true true party, old guys basically got him off track, and he was not able to resist uh, uh, those those pressures. Right. In, in fact, there are some writings that talk about the palace coup. So in fact, there are some people who think that uh, the 1980 coup, there was a palace coup plan for, uh, I think, 79, that his his own, you know, the old guys wanted to overthrow him. And I don't yeah. know if they did. No, no, what they didn't. I mean, there are all kind of explanations about the palace, um, about the 1980 coup. I mean, one explanation, of course, if you read the late Mrs. Torbos, uh a book, I think it's called Lift It Up. 
uh, mm -hmm. which she published in 96, uh, you know, she, she, you know, she accuses the U.S. of involvement in that coup. So, I mean, there are others who have made that, who have made that argument as well that that's, it was a, a, a plain American coup because uh, they saw Torbo's policy of opening up to the Soviet, then Soviet Union and other socialist countries as being detrimental to the interest of the United States. And so the U.S. intervened to remove it. So, I mean, there are, you know, various explanations about that. There's a question on Facebook from M. Cox Mitchell. So most presidents had mixed ethnic identities. Given intermarriages and migration patterns, many argue that there are no pure ethnic identities. Can you address the mixed identities, mixed ethnic identities of former presidents? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, 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 most of them, I mean, particularly, the, the, you know, from robbers to from rabbis to rabbis, Pin, Warner, all of them were, you know, were, I mean, because all of them, all of them, you know, basically came from the U.S., yeah. uh, mainly from the South. So these were basically who, uh, you know, folks who had black mothers and, uh, and uh, you know, because one of the, one of the uh, uh, rare, rare uh, uh, negative effects of slavery uh, was where, you know, slave owners, you know, you know, basically, you know, rape women and hire children by them. So, you know, uh, uh, that's how we got the so-called mulatto or light-skinned uh, sector of that repatriated group. So robbers, and most of them, yeah, came from that mixed, mixed ancestry. And then even when they got to Liberia, right. uh, uh, you know, a number of them married uh, uh, women from the various indigenous ethnic groups. So there are a lot of Liberians uh, who may have on their paternal side linked to uh, the repatriated Africans from here and then on their maternal side from 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 one of the one of the indigenous ethnic groups so that I mean that's a that's a good point when that's that situation is, is actually uh, actually quite common I mean one of two of the people that already come to mind two prominent Liberians they are deceased now who come to mind to uh, to clearly reflect that that makes identity the late Dr. Mary Anthony Brown Sherman, who in my humble opinion was not only one of the most principal presidents I ever knew, but the greatest president of the University of Liberia. Her mom was Vi, and her father, Louis Arthur Graham, uh, was a repatriate extraction. So was her brother, J. Rudolph Graham, who was Minister of Foreign Affairs. Wow. One of the presidents, what I read, of uh, uh, Charles D.B. King, I learned that his both parents were from Sierra Leone. Yeah, because in fact, King King reflect another interesting current because we, you know, the we have four major currents. One current, of course, uh, will be the repatriated Africans from the U.S. The second current will be the indigenous ethnic group. The third current will be those who came from the Caribbean, the poor Edwin Edwin Blad, Edward Blading, and then the fourth current will be folks who came from other African countries like Sierra Leone and Nigeria. So King was in that category. His parents came from Sierra Leone. How did that play in at that time? Did, did it not matter? Well, it did not matter in a sense that what a number of the Africans who came from other African countries basically did uh, was that they, they, they basically incorporated themselves within the, the dominant repatriate uh, community. Mm. So, so King was basically, you know, King was basically one of them. Uh, and in fact, I included people even from the Caribbean as well. So they came and they, you know, and they were accepted into the dominant community. So the 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 the, the current that was not accepted into that community, as I said during our earlier discussion, for about hundred years was was the indigenous community. But all of the other currents were accepted. The ones who came from other African countries, the ones who came from the Caribbean, they all were accepted. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, and, and I I listened to your. Your nine, the 2014 oration right here in Georgia about Independence Day that you refer uh -huh. to, all these things has missed opportunities. Yep. Because if you if you accept someone from and someone from the Caribbean, someone from Nigeria, Sierra Leone, has citizen, but yet even to the point of becoming president, but yet you cannot accept someone from Kolahon or from Dudwiken or from. Uh, Sacred PA to be citizen. Yeah. That really was uh, 
It was a very big false start. Right, that was that was that was a, it was very very strange. I mean, and that was informed by a mindset. Okay, what, what what was that? What the mindset basically was that there was this notion that the members of these various indigenous ethnic groups basically, or quote unquote, they were not civilized, they were not Christianized, so they needed to go through a process of being civilized and Christianized first before they could be accepted into the dominant society. But I seem that same ludicrous tender was not applied to people from the Caribbean and other African countries. Hmm. Uh, M. Cox Major is still asking on the uh, ethnic line that uh, is it so Doe was President Doe was not the first indigenous president? Were, were you, how is that narrative that Doe was the first indigenous president? Well, I mean, of all of the presidents, I mean, Doe was the well, I mean, unless it, it depends on how you define indigenous. Okay. Uh, if 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 you're going strictly by by you know first the paternal side, then they, they then do will be. I mean, if you go by the maternal side, then no, it will not be do. Yeah, that that's true. Another comment is: uh, librarians always have songs for each of the president. In fact, let me let me play one. This one was for President Tabra. So the question is, is it the citizen really that uh, set up this president or this president because of the imperial presidency you talk about, people just want to uh, pay lip service? Well, they pay lip service, they are basically opportunists. So the, you know, that's that's the way they ingratiated themselves with those presidents were not for their own personal benefits. So those were just praise singers. This one was for President Tabra. All right, so uh, even though we didn't rank them, but when you look at all the, the Labyrinth presidents, all of them, when I was, when we were at uh, when we started advertising the show, let me give you the background. There were some comments that, that all of them are bad, all of them are, in fact, there is no point even discussing them because they all have failed Liberia. They all did not develop the country. They are bad leaders. So there's no point even thinking about ranking. What is the what is your counter to that or uh, criticism? Well, no, I mean, but I mean I, I agree that the country is not where we all want it to be, but I don't think we can use a, a, a very broad brush to uh, say they were all by presidents because as we try uh, during the, the quick survey, they, they, they all face different kinds of circumstances. Some of them there with them fairly well and some did not. So I don't think we can call all of them by presidents. I mean, you can't call Roberts a by president. I mean, he, he certainly has, I mean, he, all those presidents, like all of us as human beings, have our own weaknesses and our strengths. And that's how, we, that's how we characterize it. They had their weaknesses and their strengths. Uh, so we can just say, you know, you know, quite broadly, oh no, they had no strength, they were all weaknesses. Because, I mean, look at the kind of challenges that they dealt with. I mean, the kind of yeah. challenges that somebody that Robert there with as the first president, as we all know, anybody who is the first at providing leadership for any organization, whether it's a country or anything, that's, that's a daunting task. So I don't think you can just, Dismiss some of the robbers and say, "Oh, well, no, 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 you're not." Because, because even when, even between Robbers' first run at the presidency and his second run after James Smith with the Royal Remover, he spent he was Labrador's ambassador to France. And so he spent his time trying basically to find ways, at least diplomatically, uh, to ensure the survival of the Labrador state state itself. So I don't think you can one can just dismiss that as as no success. All right. And that's what happened when you read history backwards. But if you put yourself in a position of those people at that time, you will try to cut them some slack. Well, yeah, you gotta, we got to cut them some slack. Let's talk about opposition during this time, because uh, one time you made mention of D2A. So the, the, the whole idea of opposition during this time, because the opposition to help to make the government you know, stronger. So just, uh, I don't know if there were 
other opposition. Okay, there was fuck now. Just touch briefly on opposition during this whole survey of LeBron presidents that uh, that you can think of. We always had opposition parties in Liberia. In fact, Liberia, Liberia from its founding in 1847, as I said, even within a limited scope of the denial of citizenship to the majority on the 1947, even within a very limited scope, there were competitive party politics from J.J. Roberts all the way to Tottenham. Uh, the opposition got crushed on Tottenham. So in all of the elections that were held, there were, there were always opposition candidates. But when, 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 by the time we got around the presidency of Charles D.B. King, electoral fraud became a, a mainstay of the Liberian political process. Okay, let's let even go back to Roberts. Roberts tried to run for a fourth term and his own vice president defeated him. Now that, that, that would not have been possible if you really did not have a free and fair election because he was an incumbent. So if, 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 if the election on that free and fair, there's no way Stevie A. Benson would defeat that Roberts and become the okay. second president. But the King administration, as I said, introduced the element of fraud. So, so beginning with King, we started seeing fraudulent elections. And then, of course, that was institutionalized by the True Will Party, beginning with, with Todman, even though it was a single political party and you had single candidates on the ballot, they were they were they were they were staying engaged in fraud. Say the president won by ninety nine percent of the vote, and then you look at the the count, uh, the number of votes the president got clearly more than the number of registered voters. So so they 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 the, we have viable opposition. I would say from oh about eighteen forty seven to nineteen fifty five. So the country has the country has the country has a rich history of opposition political parties. Let's look at President Tobert. He, he was in power for nine years. Why was there no election at that time? Looking at you know how our current dialogue kind of portraying as someone who was a visionary and someone who was more progressive compared to his uh, predecessor. Well, because the old guys, the old guys were not going to allow uh, a, an opposition political party to challenge them because they know that. You know, given their performance, they are, you know they, they had a very tenuous hold on power, and they were going to def they were going to get defeated. Because if you take in 1980, very briefly, PAL became the Progressive People Party. It went through the constitutional requirement at that time was you get a list of 300 registered voters, the the papers party papers get probated, and you are political party. So PAL was a political party for about a couple of months, and and then the old guys through the national legislature issue a resolution banning, uh, banning PPP. Mm. But they did not want any opposition party at all. And President Tobo bowed to that pressure. And so then there was a coup. Then of course, of course we, we, we had a 1980 coup. And then, and then the, the, the election that brought Dodo power was a multi-party election, but that election also was fraudulent. Because we got, we got, you know, don't use the election commission to basically rig the process. But there mm. were there were strong opposition parties in that election. And don't forget, uh, before that election, do 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 bad and uh, uh, LPP and UPP who were the, the the two most popular political parties at that time. LPP an upshoot of Moja and UPP an upshoot of Far, basically said that those parties could not run in that election. And even with that. He still got defeated by Jackson Doe, who then was the late Jackson Doe, then who was the state bearer of lab. And that was how the election commission led by Emmett Hammer engaged in a fraud that led to uh, Doe being elected president, which helped trigger the 1985 who went by led abortive coup. Hmm. There's a question on Facebook from Banedo. He said, Professor Kier, how should we deal with the Liberia's imperial presidency? Which scholars like you point to has been problematic to Liberia's national development? Well, one of the ways in which you get deal with that is that we need constitutional reform. Uh, one of the major sources of the imperial presidency is that the president has very expensive power of appointment. We need constitutional re reform so that most of those folks that the president can appoint, those people, those jobs can be made civil service position or those people can be elected. That, for example, now you take 
the president of La Brona even appoint, appoint city mayors. Mm -hmm. The mayors of cities and city councils should be elected as part of this constitutional reform that I'm that I'm speaking about. Justice of the peace should not be appointed by the president. You know, all, so there are a number of, of, of positions under the under Article 52 that, that really need to be removed so that so that, that will help then to basically reduce this power of the imperial presidency. And there are some laws also. I mean, the, the president does not only have the power of appointment in the political arena, he has the power, he or she has the power of appointment also in the education arena. The president appoints the University of Liberia and the presidents of all of our public university, public tertiary institution. The president even appoints the principal of BWI. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, the, the historians are coming at you. Dr. Brewer is asking, say, can Professor Keir discuss the dynamics of the Sawyer for Mayor campaign, its background and consequences? What the Sawyer for Mayor campaign was one of the major tests of the of the true of true party hegemony. Uh, Dr. Sawyer at that time was a professor at the University of Liberia, and uh, so the idea was that uh, the electoral system needed to be tested because keep in mind. There was nothing in the law that said that the True Party was the only political party in the country. It was just by practice, because because mm -hmm. Tottenham had crushed the opposition, uh, so you know uh, the party was not challenged. So Dr. Sawyer's uh, run for the mayor of Monrovia was a test uh, of that. But as soon as that began, in terms of consequences, uh, it, it really grew like wildfire and started gaining a lot of support at Nigeria and Maria, but across the country. As soon as that started happening, I was in the meeting at week President Trump then said that he was postponing the election. And I believe that the major mistake that was made when President Trump said he was postponing the election is that we did not challenge that. We accepted that elect the postponement of the election and that's and that's how the Sawyer for Mayor campaign basically fizzled. But I mean, it made a, it made a major contribution in terms of challenging the system but by the same token, I, I believe the progressives made a major mistake by not really, really using that as a mobilization movement to say, you know what, Mr. President, the election will go on and we'll, we'll vote for the next mayor of Monrovia. But that was accepted. Asata Mandita Sawi said, great job, Dr. Kia. Quick question. When did lo lower Lofa County, like Vahon District, become taxpayers in Liberia? You, you, you mentioned that uh, these people were not citizens, but they were paying taxes. So I think the question is along those lines. Well, well, yeah, I mean, so it means that basically from about 1904, when the Barclay plan was put in effect with the hot tax, from 1904 to about 1947, where, you know, whatever folks were in Vahon or other parts of the country, as long as they were of indigenous extraction, they were not citizens, but they were still paying hot tax. Hmm. Samyon. Adewoli say, which of the president will you say develop Liberia with achievements in the 20th century? Which of those presidents will you say try? I will say Talbot. Another question from uh, Alex Devine say, is Alex Devine is watching from Monrovia say, is multi party democracy good for Liberia? Professor Kier. Well, yeah, multi-party multi -party democracy is good because, but the, the unfortunate thing in our situation is that in the midst of poverty and economic hardship, it is very difficult for opposition parties to be viable. I mean, if we had a situation where opposition parties were viable and they were presenting alternative policy positions, yeah, multi-party multi -party democracy can really, really, really be providing an the environment. But that's why we got to address the issue of, of poverty and, and economic uh, independence. Because in a poverty stricken country, uh, you know, opposition parties cannot thrive. People want to, people want to basically hang on to, they want to hang on to the ruling party. Because they know that where their daily bread will come from. So even if they don't mm -hmm. support the ruling party's policies, uh, and given the way in which we, we have politicized everything in Liberia, including jobs, that you know, if you don't belong to the ruling party, you can't work for your own country, which is asinine. Yeah, I mean, so it's difficult for an opposition party to thrive in that kind of environment because it really has nothing. 
It has, it has nothing to really offer the voters, particularly in an environment of that nature where, where survival is paramount. Dr. Sam, Samuel Govo said, Prof. Kia, there has been this effort of trying to write a comprehensive history of Liberia. How do you think that will contribute to the fragile unity in Liberia? What would be the way forward to having a Liberian identity? Well, the comprehensive history is very important because it has to be written uh, so that we all can know that what we call Liberia is actually the byproduct of, of the efforts and contribution of various currents, uh, the ones we talked about before, uh, Liberians who uh, came from the, the were repatriated from the US, Liberians who came from other African countries, Liberians who came from the, who became Liberian, who came from the Caribbean, and of course, uh, the members of the various African groups that came from different parts of the continent as these uh, empires be uh, began to collapse. So, uh, you know, if, if, if we can write about the experiences of each of these groups and then find ways in which all of these experiences sort of uh, converge and gel together in terms of a Liberian identity, I mean, clearly that would be a major contribution because uh, we, we don't really know who we are. You know, we, I mean, if, you, if, if you're reading Liberian history and it tells you basically that everything started after 1822, that's, 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 not a full, that's not a full picture. It really doesn't have the situation. So I believe that our comprehensive history will enhance our knowledge of one another. And uh, within that context, context, be respectful of and sensitive not just to our different cultural backgrounds, but appreciative of the contributions that all of these currents have made uh, individually and collectively. And that's why I make Liberia a pan-African nation. Exactly. exactly. Albert Peel is asking, what led to the death of Ben Freeman and the rise of Turbot to the vice presidency? I don't know anything about that. Well, the, Benjamin G. Freeman was chosen as President Tottenham's running mate after President Tottenham had uh, some problem with C.L. Simpson, because Simpson really wanted to be president, and President Tottenham knew that, so he was not going to take him for a second term. So he decided to choose B.G. Freeman. B.G. Freeman was the Speaker of the House from Carisburg. And then, of course, uh, just before uh, the election, he died under mysterious circumstances. I mean, there had no uh, you know, evidence pointing in any one particular direction in terms of what, 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 what was responsible for his death. But that's how then President Tottenham then chose Tobo, who was a member of the House of Representatives at that time, to be his running mate. Ramos Sagi say, can you please tell us something good about President Samuel Kanyondo? <laughs> but uh, if I add a personal note, uh, President Samuel Do, I knew personally. Uh, even before he became uh, the military leader and, and president. So I, of, uh, of all of the Liberian presidents, that's the one I knew very well. At least I knew him personally. Uh, despite all of the policy agreements I have with him and other Liberians have with him, including you know violation of human rights and whatnot, one area in which I will credit him for was that he made some efforts towards economic and social development. So I mean, that would be one area. I mean, we, there were a number of development projects that he tried to undertake roles and whatnot. Uh, so I'll credit him for that. Uh, I will also credit him for his support for public higher education. I mean, I was president of the University of Liberia Student Union you know, when the coup happened. And, 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 and you know, despite policy differences with, 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 the, with President Doe, I mean, I know the PRC, you know, invested substantial amount of money in the University of Liberia. So that was that was really good because he recognized the the value of education. And that's why he himself, you know, eventually went there and, you know, through tutoring, you know, I mean, whether one questions that or not, was able to get a bachelor's degree from there. So, I mean, he made some, you know, his administration already made some good contribution to education. And lastly, uh, he tried to solve a problem that has bedeviled Liberia for many years, which is that we don't have government buildings for our public offices. We're always renting buildings. He realized that, and that's how, you know, a number of these major projects that the, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Defense, that had those projects really got started because he wanted to be able to address the government dependence on 
basically private landlords to house government offices. So those will, those will be some areas in which clearly I'll, I'll, I will credit him for. And that's why that's why I said before in my in my comment, uh, the, the, the 25 people who have served as president, like every human being, they have their strengths and their weaknesses. And I don't think we can just sort of just dismiss them of a broad marriage. Let's talk about our current president, even though the time is, is uh, short, he's been there for a very short time, but there's a African proverb which I like to use to say, you can tell if a dog will hunt by the way it sits by the fire. From the one, from the one year and few months of President Weir, what can you tell? Well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, how do I characterize it? I'm, I'm disappointed by the direction things have taken and for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that, you know, as someone who contested against President Weir in 2005 and was involved in all of those conversations and whatnot, I know that whether one agrees or disagree, you have uh, young people the, who constitute the majority of the country, particularly the majority of voters, who particularly have high hope uh, in the government, I will address their material conditions and whatnot. And I have not seen policies being developed in that area. And and you know, uh, and 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 you know, our young people, as, as as we all know, they constitute the majority and whatnot. And that's a group that really, really need our attention because we have a serious problem of youth alienation in Liberia. It didn't begin with President We are, but but that's that's an area in which I would have hoped that. Uh, the administration will have begun developing some policies around and around some of these pressing issues, poverty. I mean, you know, the, 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 I would have thought the government will come up with public work programs as as uh, as a sort of a short term employment to get people, you know, uh, gainfully employed. Uh, you know, cash transfers for Liberians who are, are, are facing serious economic conditions. So there, there are a number of policy tools. That at least uh, I expected, you know, or uh, I hope will be employed to, to deal with some of the pressing issues at home. Basically, you know, until the government really gets its foot in to uh, then begin to design uh, some major policies. And, and unfortunately, I, I don't see things moving in that direction. Hmm. All right, Dr. Kia, we're almost out of time. I want to uh, thank you so much for the time. I also want to thank our viewers across the globe, including those on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, as we conclude, I just want to hear your final comments as you wrap this up and uh, just uh, talk to us briefly about anything that we didn't cover that you want to cover and uh, a summary of what we've just covered. Well, uh, again, you know, my final brief comments are that, you know, uh, certainly our country is not in a place that we would like for it to be. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, the mass abject poverty, the very serious social and economic challenges that people are facing. Uh, you know, certainly we, we their conditions need to be better. Uh, so my 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 hope and prayer is that we have to work in both our individual capacities as well as collectively in whatever ways we can to really help improve the material conditions of our people in Liberia and, and in respect of who the president is. I mean, we need to, we, you know, we, 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 we need to develop a mindset where our loyalty fundamentally is to Liberia and not, and not really the, the occupant of the presidency. I think we get too consumed. I'm not suggesting that the presidency, as someone who's run for the office, I know is important. I'm not suggesting it's not important, it's important, but we get too concerned with the occupant, and we, we, you know, we, we, we should. But I'm, I'm saying, as far as saving Liberia is concerned, doing the best for Liberia, that should not be shaped by who the president is. Wherever you are, whether you're in the United States, you're in Europe, you're in Canada, you're on the African continent, including at home in Liberia, do your best as an individual. Work with other people to help improve the condition of our country because Liberia is the only place we have. And it will be what we make it to be. 
Finally, we need to really, really, really get beyond this ethnic divide. As I said before in one of my comments, it should not really matter what someone's ethnic background is. That's the accident of birth. That individual has no control over it. No mm -hmm. ethnic group in Liberia or anywhere else has either the monopoly of good or the monopoly of evil. So we need to work with Liberians across the ethnic divide based on what Dr. King called the contents of their character. Liberians who love Liberia, who are committed to Liberia, who want to see our country develop, we need to work together so that Liberia can stop being the object of ridicule and the subject of pity. Hmm. Before, and I'm sorry to bring this up because this question keeps coming back on, um, and I don't want uh, those who are the campaigners of the war crime code to, to think that I have anything against them. There's a question here about what you think about the establishment of the war crime court. I know it's kind of a little removed from our discussion tonight, but if you can comment, please. But there has to be accountability in Liberia. What we call a war crime court or whatever name we, we gave it. Look, there's, there's a culture of impunity in Liberia, as we discussed before, whether it's people who committed war crimes or people who commit economic and other crimes, they believe that they can do that and get away with it. One of the ways in which we move forward in Liberia is that people gotta be brought to book. Now, establishing a war crime code does not mean that you just go arrest them and throw in jail. You establish a process, whether we call it war crime code, what we even want to give it, where people who are accused are given the right to come and defend themselves. And if they are found guilty, they need to be held accountable. That's the only way we're going to go beyond. The culture of impunity is one of our biggest problems. And not really accounting for those who brought the first and second war on our country and caused such devastation, particularly to lives, not holding those people accountable will not be in the best interest of Liberia. Thank you so much. Next week, we're going to be back on focus on Liberia. Our guests will have three youth groups. Okay, we want to continue on to uh, elevate, to promote, and educate all things Liberia. So there are, you know, there are youth groups in Liberia that are doing extremely well. One of them is uh, Educate Liberia. Another group is Youth for Change. Youth for Change is the one that is currently doing the uh, uh, high school debates and things of along those lines. And then we have another group in America called the Young. Uh, innovative leaders of Liberia yell. We want to have this group on next week to discuss Liberia, of course. The week after that, we're going to bring three uh, candidates that contested in the Liberian elections for the House of Representatives. One from Nimba, Montserrado, and Sino County. They will be here and share their experiences because after you run for election and you know, sometimes people don't know what else you're up to. So we want to bring them or uh, the following Sunday to discuss. But Dr. Kia, it's been a pleasure having you. We're very thankful. We know you are very busy, man. Thanks so much for taking time off your schedule. And uh, you will deal like, you know, one thing you said about when I read your profile that you are instructor at uh, AME, U, Uni AME University, I was very much uh, impressed by that, that someone from America teaching at a renowned university in, like, in America can go back and stay in the classroom and teach our brothers and sisters, I really want to thank you for that. Thank you so much, Dennis, for the opportunity to appear on Focus on Liberia. It's a privilege and honor. And uh, in fact, I'm on my way to Liberia on Thursday, and I'm going to be spending some time uh, working with teachers and students at AMEU as well. And that, that goes to the point I made earlier. We got to do for Liberia, irrespective of where we are, geography should that be, should that be a limitation. OK. On that note, from all of us, uh, my co-host Danielle Knuckles, who is not here tonight, my guest relations manager Stephanie Cetro, and all of us at Focus on Labro want to say thank you so much for coming. Thanks to our guests for joining us. Until next time, my name is Dennis Jar, wishing you a godly night. Good night. <laughs>